So um, welcome to everyone, just as um, you guys are coming in. Um, to the climate change webinar. If you're not meaning to be in the climate change webinar, you're in the wrong place. Um, just I'll introduce our panel today. Um, who we're working with. So we've got Nick Tate um, based in our Lincoln office. Nick is a project manager here at Darien Z. Um, then from our Wellington team, we've got Laura Syme, Roger Lincoln, and Sophie McCaskill. And um, the key point is Sophie and Laura um, will be answering your questions that we don't get to in, in the webinar. So if you do get um, if you do get a response from Sophie or Laura, you think that's odd. Where'd that come from? That's um, that's from those guys. And then, of course, Fraser um, McGurgan is with us from Fakatane, and he's here as our boss because he is a dairy farmer and a climate change ambassador. So um, I'm just going to share my screen with you now. My name is Sarah. I'll be your facilitator for the next hour. Typically, when I do an on-farm event, I do the health and safety first, but I don't know if you are healthy and safe, but I hope that you are. Put your cup of tea in a place where you can't spill it on yourself. Always use sunscreen and download the COVID app if you haven't and actively use it. So we've had our health and safety um, induction and let's get into our webinar. So, um, sorry, closed. The plan of attack for today is um, we've got our three key speakers as our panel. We're going to touch on um, the Climate Change Commission's announcement, the reasons that we're um, looking for these changes to be made in emissions reductions, and then Frazier's going to talk about ways to reduce emissions. So as we go along at the end of each panelist's presentation, we'll take questions. If you'd like to um, provide a question, we've got this Q&A section, so you can pop your question in there. And again, if I don't get to have um, read your question out during the webinar, um, Sophie or Laura will answer it um, via, via the Q&A section. So um, first up, we have Roger Lincoln. Um, Roger is a senior policy advisor based in Wellington. So if at any time you see him, sh his camera shake, it's not because he's bumped the table, but it's just a wee earthquake. Um, Roger has four kids and um, that's his greatest achievement, but he's also worked in um, with government and with policy for many years. And so we're quite privileged to have him as part of the Dairy and Zed team. Um, but before we get into Roger's presentation, I'm just keen to know from you guys, how do you feel about the Climate Change Commission's draft advice um, that was released in January? So I'm just gonna launch a poll. Um, I'll give you guys 30 seconds to a minute um, to respond. We've got, I don't know how, know much about what's been recommended, I'm concerned, and I'm comfortable with what the climate change's recommendations are. So we're nearly halfway with people voting. We'll just give it another 20 seconds. Still have some answers coming in. Oh, they're slowing down now. Five, four, three, two, one. I'll end polling here and we'll just share the results. So this is kind of the gut feel um, of what's out there, Roger. We've got a third of people who don't know that much, 40% um, who are concerned and about a quarter that are, that are comfortable. So um, I'll just stop sharing those results. That gives us a bit of a vibe. Um, for where our people are at and um, give us a bit of a, a background update on, on where we are now. Great, thanks Sarah and um, hi everybody. Uh, as Sarah said, my name is Roger Lincoln and I work for you. Um, I um, heard the dairy auction results this morning and uh, I was filled with a sense of pride. So as I said, it's, um, it's fantastic to be able to work for you and you should be proud of what you do for the New Zealand economy as well. Um, I also wanted to just sort of say that um, yet another thing has come along that um, dairy farmers need to think about 
Um, and I know some of you are anxious about that as um, evidence from the, the poll result there. Um, and it can look overwhelming, but um, we will help you through this, um, both with advocacy and some practical advice. I thought I'd start um, right at the top. So a little bit of context, where does all this stuff come from? So um, remember the Paris Agreement, the Global Agreement, New Zealand put in its target for what it thinks it can do by 2030. Um, and then there was the Zero Carbon Act in 2019. And so this is translating New Zealand's international target into the domestic context. And that Zero Carbon Act um, also set up the Climate Change Commission, whose advice we're discussing today. And the, the Zero Carbon Act also set up the framework for these carbon budgets. What are carbon budgets? Well, these are stepping stones. Or these are quotas of emissions um, that the economy uh, uh, is allowed to emit over periods of time. So that's what the carbon budgets are. And the Commission is looking at um, about 15 years ahead. So there's three blocks of five years of emissions budgets that need to be set shortly. Um, I just wanted to say in respect of the Commission that the Commission's advice is filled with um, choices and it's filled with uh, trade-offs and it's filled with judgments. So um, there's no one way to get to where we need to get to and there's no right way to get there either. So there's some choices and trade-offs and, and some judgments and those are the things that we kind of want to explore with you um, today. Um, just a reminder of the timeline for this advice that's come through from the Commission. So the next slide please, Sarah. Thanks. Um, so we get several bites of the cherry on this. So the Commission has published their draft advice and they're consulting on that currently. Um, that consultation closes the end of, of this month. And then they hand that over to the government and then the government decides what it wants to do with it. So um, the government needs to translate the advice into policy and not all that policy will be sorted this year. And so then the government needs to come back to stakeholders, the public, with what its plans are. So there's another round of consultation. And if there's any legislation as a result, then it, that also needs to go through a select committee process. So three bites at the cherry. Um, and this is not the only year. The Commission will be looking at this over time. It isn't going to go away. So we need to lay down some markers about what we think. Um, and if we disagree with the Commission, then we need to provide evidence to the contrary. Next slide, thanks, Sarah. So what does the Commission's advice um, cover? So it covers the next three carbon budgets, as I mentioned, um, to 2035. It looks at the ambition of New Zealand's target um, into the Paris Agreement and whether that's consistent with a 1.5 degree temperature goal. And it also looks at future biogenic methane reductions. Important point to make is that the Commission just provides advice. So the Commission's advice is not legislation. Um, what happens with the Commission's advice is determined by God, so the government of the day. So the government of the day translates that advice and the government may agree or may disagree, but then the government turns that advice into policy and or legislation. So like any um, report, there's, there's pros and cons, there's some good stuff and there's some, some not so good stuff. And so we think what the Commission has outlined, outlined for the ag sector is ambitious and, and challenging. So you may um, hear the Commission's advice framed as ambitious and realistic or ambitious and possible. I want you to think about it in terms of being ambitious and challenging. So we intend to highlight where we think the Commission has oversimplified the real world or made a leap that doesn't make sense. Having said that, um, what do we actually agree with? Because that's what this slide is about. So um, firstly, there is support for Hewaka Ekenoa. That may ring a bell for some of you. So remember the partnership agreement between the government and industry over agricultural pricing. Uh, Hewaka Ekenoa is up and running. It's, it still exists. It is still ongoing. And the Commission has said, keep going, and what's more government, you make sure that Hewaka Ekenoa actually succeeds. So that's a positive point. There's also good recognition through the report that methane does not need to reduce to zero. Methane is different from those long-lived gases. It doesn't accumulate in the atmosphere like CO2. So there is great recognition that methane does not need to get to zero. 
There's also recognition that planting pines is not the solution for New Zealand. So a lot of talk about decarbonizing the rest of the economy, and I can talk about that a little bit later on. And then to meet the targets, um, there will need to be significant and accelerated investment in research and development and extension. So for biogenic methane, there's good recognition that there needs to be a long-term research plan for that and there needs to be the necessary investment. Why is that important? Well, it provides a solution for farmers, but it also provides solutions for New Zealand and potentially the globe. So that's a positive thing that we should uh, uh, support. Um, what do we disagree with? So the emissions reduction path that the Commission has landed on dials up the level of ambition required for the ag sector. So the carbon budgets that the Commission have outlined to 2030 and the emissions reductions required for those budgets are more than the legislated minus 10% by 2030 target. So simply, the Commission has shifted the goalposts, if you like, in terms of what the ag sector needs to do by when particularly to 2030. So we don't support an increase in ambition in the 2030 biogenic methane emissions budgets. And this is a key point, and I think this is something that you need to think about when you're making your own submission. We will do it through the Dairy NZ um, submission as well. We also have um, some issues with some of the farm system um, assumptions that the Commission has used to inform their, their advice, and I'll talk to those in a second. Thanks, Sarah. Um, do I have to reduce my stock by 15%? So this is a question that um, we've fielded um, a, a, a lot in, um, in recent weeks. Short answer is no. Um, so this was, a, this was not a recommendation made by the Commission. The Commission has modelled the effect of policies and in the model these changes resulted in a 15% decrease in stock numbers. Um, so some of that um, relates to water policy and some of that is uh, related to some land use change, for example, from dairy into horticulture. So I think 2,000 hectares per annum from, from 2025. So this is not a rule. Farmers are not required to reduce their stock by 15%. This is the result or a function of the outputs of the modeling assumptions. Um, the Commission's pathway for um, agriculture. There's, there's two key assumptions in here and I want you to think about this from a practical um, point of view because we have some questions and we're scratching our heads as to how the Commission has, has arrived at this. So this is what we need to test and this is what we need to um, go back to the Commission on. Um, so the first um, assumption there is, um, and if you look at the graph and, and follow the, the lines from the, from the top to the bottom, so this is um, uh, a graph of is specific to dairy and looks out to 2035. So the first assumption is that we can maintain production, so that's the purple line, uh, with less methane, the green line, uh, with more milk solids per animal, that's the orange line, uh, and then with less um, animals, that's the black line, and then the red line with less uh, methane per kg of milk solids. So we're questioning, is this even, even possible? How does this work in practice? Uh, and that's what we're going backwards and forwards with the Commission on to try and understand the modeling and the assumptions uh, assumptions behind that. The second assumption that I want to talk that I want to talk about is the Commission says that we can get to 2035 and the carbon budgets that the Commission has uh, prescribed with current um, practices and technology. So we know that the 2030 target is a stretch and given that the Commission has added a little bit more ambition um, to, to 2030, you know, is this even achievable? So the Commission uh, even acknowledged this in the report. So they say this is at the limit of what, you know, they think um, they can be confident it can be delivered. So there's some question marks there as well, which we need to explore. So the Commission's pathway for agriculture, um, the Commission has recommended that the government um, ensure that the mechanisms are in place so that Hare Waka Ekanoa will endure beyond 2025. That's good. Ensure that um, broadband initiative is resourced and prioritised. That's a great enabler um, for farmers, so we're fully supportive of that. They want that long-term plan for targeted investment and uh, research and development. That's positive. And they want to review uh, and update the regulatory regimes to ensure that new technologies and practices can be rapidly deployed. So we're fully encouraging of all of those 
uh, those points. Um, what about other sectors? Because we're talking a lot about agriculture here, but um, this report is about the entire economy. So um, there's a lot, lot in this report about what everybody else has to do as well. And it's good that everybody has to do um, something as well, not just agriculture. So the advice will impact every part of the economy. And here's just some examples. So no light internal combustion engine vehicles imported after 2032, uh, a phase down to no coal power process heat after 2037, and no new gas connections to buildings after 2025. So although these examples are in other sectors, they impact farmers too. So your transport, your energy, your processing companies, industrial heat. So it's important that farmers have viable economic options when, in respect of some of these other policies that the Commission is recommending to government. So what does the path to 2030 look like for you? Will this affect the way you farm? Yes, um, undoubtedly, but let's put this in context. This is over time uh, and this is a transition. So this needs to be a fair transition. It needs to be a manageable transition. It needs to be realistic and it needs to be affordable. Um, Fraser will talk a little bit more about what he's doing on farm. Do uh, you have to destock? No, but some of the legislative changes uh, may drive destocking for some farmers, as will some land use change. Do I have to start reducing emissions now? This is kind of like a, a, a yes and a no for me. I put no, um, but you do need to start preparing yourself for change. So we've uh, commenced the program in terms of knowing your numbers, and that's the first step. So next steps for us uh, to pull together um, Dairy and Z submission. And as I said before, we will uh, go back to the commission on things we disagree with and provide evidence uh, where we think the commission has got it wrong. We'll do this um, on your behalf. Um, we'd like you to amplify some of those messages. So we're providing a template for you, which should be up uh, on the Dairy and Z website uh, next week. Um, so we'll make it easy and simple for you to um, make your views known and you should and need to make your views known. Submission uh, date closes on the 28th of March and you'll find more details on the dairynz.co.nz um, website. Thank you, Sarah. All right, thanks. Um, thanks for that, Roger. So um, our first question, I think we've got one in the top of the south um, and Golden Bay. Um, Tyler Langford, you raised your hand. Do you want to ask your question? Oh, actually, we've got Lone Sorensen. So, Lone, do you want to take um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. Oh, brilliant. Oh, it's, it's go. about a question uh, which I've been quite uh, vocal about for a while uh, because I don't believe most of what is uh, said about the emissions when it comes to ruminants because nowhere is the relationship between the cow, the grass, uh, the sun, the soil and the microorganism taken in. And I know there's US research uh, that has proven that when you do that, you actually bind more carbon in the soil as hummus as, than the cows are actually emitting. And none of that is taking it to, to all this year. Um, you know, so for me, uh, it's really, really frustrating when that is not part of it. Uh, the other thing that really frustrates me is that, um, you know, I farm in Marlborough, I'm surrounded by trees. I've planted thousands of trees myself. We have got forest, we have got bush, we have got all sorts of things. So there's absolutely no flinking way that I am emitting as much as one kilo of uh, methane uh, that has any harmful effect as far as I'm concerned. We are also talking about natural methane. We are not as talking about methane as a whole because natural methane also works in a different way has always been part of the planet. And lastly, we've actually got less ruminants on the planet than we had about a hundred years ago. So yeah, so why is there nothing the about question that you had? Yeah, that is about why is there nothing about the hummus we are binding in the ground with our ruminants? There's nothing about that. They are working on it in the US and in Europe, but we seem to just forget about it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Roger, how would you like to respond to that question? Yeah, there's there's, there's a lot in there. Um, let me just pick a couple of things. So um, in terms of the soil carbon, 
I mean, the commission has, has raised the issue of soil carbon. They say um, there's not enough evidence. So when they look at soil carbon, they don't look, just look at what's happening on dairy farms. They look across the entire uh, landscape of New Zealand. So getting a good handle on that is really, really important. And I know through Hiwaka Ekanoa, the same thing. Um, where is the evidence? Um, there's some positives, there's some negatives. What does it mean as a whole? Are we a, a net source or, or, a, or a net sink or are we a carbon reservoir? So that work continues. Put that in your in your submission. In terms of planted trees, yes. So um, there is sort of growing um, realization that farmers need to be recognized for on-farm sequestration. So there's a lot of talk about offsets. So just making sure that those offsets are, are, are credible. Uh, and of course, with animal, uh, um, well, with with the numbers that we're talking about for methane, 1990 is always a is always a, a base year. But with the targets, we're looking at you know 20, 2017, 2018 for the carbon budgets. So um, I would just make those points in your in your submission. Excellent. Thanks, Roger. I've got another question here from Karina. Um, so she was wondering, what is the actual emissions target for dairy farming? So in 2030 and 2050, do we have that? Uh, not an actual target for dairy farming. So the, the, the budgets and the legislated target presently are for agriculture as a whole. So it's biogenic methane and some of that is from the waste sector, but it includes animal agriculture. So there is a minus 10 to, um, to 2030. And then with the budgets, if you tally up all of the budgets, it comes to something like minus 13, and that'll need to be shared across the sector. How that's done is, um, you know, watch this space. Okay. Um, then we have a question from one of that 25% who had, who knew some stuff about the Climate Change Commission's report. So um, Tony Franson from the Waikato says, um, the Climate Change Commission's report assumes that there's an 8 to 9 percent reduction in methane from current policies such as water quality policy. How does this align with Deary and Zed's projections? So I think you'll find that it's actually a 7 percent reduction in methane and that translates as an 8 to 10 percent decrease in stock numbers. So um, in terms of the, the modelling that the Commission has done, they have relied on some MPI uh, figures and models. And so we're going backwards and forwards with MPI to better understand what that actually is. So I'm sorry, Tony, I don't have an answer for you at the moment. We're checking into those details. Okay, so is that something that we could answer later and put on the website, Roger? Yeah, definitely. Cool. All right. Well, I think that is all the questions that we have for you today. So thanks so much for your contribution, um, Roger. And I am going to move to our next panelist, um, Nick Tate. So Nick is um, based in our Lincoln office. He is a project manager um, with Deary and Zed and for the last five years has been working on environmental projects, affluent wintering, and now here in climate change. Um, but he also comes from good Southland dairy farming stock. So um, the first, first step, just to give Nick for a bit of a feel again for our audience, um, what actions or have you or will you take um, to reduce your emissions? So I'm just going to launch that poll now. We've got, I don't plan on changing anything. I plan to make some changes once the targets are clearer. I have a goal for my farm and a plan on how to reduce. And I've already started making changes. So um, we'll just give ourselves another maybe 30 seconds as our answers come in. Um, we've Got some interesting thoughts there. Uh, let's five, four, three, two, one. I'll end the polling now and just um, share the results with you. So we've got some people who don't plan on making any changes at all. Um, the majority of people are planning to make ch changes once targets are clearly set. But interestingly enough, a quarter of people are already starting to make changes on their farm now, which um, 
the government actually will be delighted with. Um, so Nick, I'm going to move us into talking about efficiency. Um, do you want to share with the group um, the research? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sarah, and um, welcome everybody. Um, so my name is Nicholas Tate. So I lead the climate change project at Dairy NZ. So what I really want to talk today about is kind of some of the research that's come out and some of those drivers behind. Uh, the policy and other things around um, why it's important that we uh, maintain our world leading status and, and move further through our programs such as step change and things like that. So as you can see here, and you've probably been aware that back in January we released our um, ca carbon footprint research. So that look was commissioned by us and, and undertaken independently by Ag Research. And it does show that we, it reinforces what we kind of knew that New Zealand dairy farmers have the lowest carbon footprint of milk production in the world. And that sits at about 0.77 CO2 equivalents per fat and protein corrected milk. So that last part, fat and protein corrected milk, that's really important as kind of a, the functional unit. And that, so that's a, that's a standardized way to compare different countries' outputs. So it's making sure that it's on a nutritional basis, not on a literage basis or other things like that. We also had to set some system boundaries around that. So that's set as cradle to farm gate. So everything that happens before the farm gate or before your milk and, milk and meat leave the property boundary. So that includes upstream emissions such as fuel and, and obviously imported feed and um, fertiliser and things like that. So this does read a really good picture for us and it shows us that we're really good and really efficient and we need to sell that story but we don't need to rest on our laurels and, and do nothing going forward. It's really a, a, an important um, message that we continue to innovate and continue to find solutions and uptake of new technology going forward. And that leads me on to kind of my next um, slide about why the importance around making sure that we address emissions and reduce them in the long run and, um, and start incorporating them into our kind of our whole farm business when we're going forward. And uh, there's a number of drivers behind this, and it's to follow on from the from the carbon footprint. We need to maintain our world leading um, uh, status. There was lots of international interest in that carbon footprint work in, um, from across the globe, from scientists from all over the over the country, over the globe, from Ireland and places like that. Um, and they they are starting to think about ways that they can uh, they can reduce their footprint as well. And given that we export a majority of our product, we need to make sure that we have those access to markets and we have those, um, those, those kind of that, that point around saleability, I guess, of having a low carbon footprint product. Uh, there is growing expectations from consumers across the world around understanding um, the carbon footprint of the products they consume. And given that we have to add an, an extra bit on from in terms of transport to, to market across the globe, then we need to make sure that we're, we're leading um, that area in terms of uh, carbon efficiency. There also is some, as Roger has alluded to, some legislative requirements. Obviously, internationally, um, commitments that we've made, and then domestically through our zero carbon bill. And um, and that goes a bit further than what um, obviously Roger talks to. I mean, and, and it is around here, Waka Ikanoa, our primary sector partnership. And there is some milestones in there that we need to start thinking about and start addressing um, because the, the alternative of agricultural entering the ETS is, is the, the thing that we're trying to avoid. And finally, there are some financial drivers. And those financial drivers um, come with our uh, starting to come through our milk supply companies, um, Sinlay's lead with pride, and now Fonterra's competitive advantage. So there are some financial drivers there that should um, make us look at the way we can farm sustainably. And also our financial markets, i.e. our banks, are starting to offer sustainably linked loans as well. So those are some real key drivers for us going forward. So now I'm just going to sort of go into uh, talk a bit more in depth about Hewaka Ikenoa and what it is. 
Um, many of you will probably know or have heard of what the, the outputs of this program are and why it's coming about, but I thought I'd just um, clarify a few things. So obviously back is part of the, the response to the Zero Carbon Act. The, um, there was an interim climate change committee that was established that um, recommended to the government that agriculture be priced at a producer point of obligation, i.e. through our Fonterras or Sinlays or meat arcas or, or milk supply companies. So the Food and Fibre Leaders Forum proposed an alternative, which is Hiwaki Kanoa, and it's a joint action plan to reduce emissions and build a system to eventually price emissions on farm post-2025. So it is working towards having that plan and the calculating emissions for farmers and then having that price incentive. But ultimately it's designing a consistent and robust reporting system for all of agriculture, not just dairy so that from 2025 onwards we have that on-farm point of obligation and it's not through our processes. So how are we tracking in Hiwaka? Um, it's actually, Hiwaka is broken down into five work streams currently. There is some, some changes in, in structure happening at the moment. Uh, I think next slide, Sarah. Um, so, so what the first outputs is really around um, from our farm planning, so making sure that we have good guidance about what um, greenhouse gas emissions components would look like in terms of farm planning, and that should be released this month. And then within the reporting work stream, there's some milestones that, um, that link to the to obviously legislation, and that's making sure that 25% of all farmers, not just dairy farmers, have an emissions or know their number by uh, 31st of December this year, and then 100% of farmers, uh, the subsequent constant the, the next year. For us, that's really, um, that's really achievable, but because just about all of our dairy companies have provided farmers um, with emissions reports this year, about 95% of our dairy farmers have emissions reports. So that's really a good first step in knowing your number, so that then you can obviously think about what options you have around um, possible mitigation scenarios going forward. There's other work streams obviously within Hiwaki Kanoa and some of the questions that came through in our polls that we did on Facebook before this webinar um, should be able to be answered here. So um, obviously the emissions pricing work stream is kind of a big, um, a big one and that's designing a pricing mechanism um, to present to the government by this time next year um, for consideration. The on-farm sequestration work stream is really looking at developing a standard methodology for um, accounting for small-scale sequestration, such as sinks, such as tree blocks and shelter belts and riparian areas. Um, and extension innovation and early adoption work streams is, is really one work stream, but it's really about um, increasing uptake with farmers and, and knowledge with farmers so they, they, they're informed about the decisions that they might have to make. Um, and it's the big component, the early adoption component, is really making sure that we recognise farmers and not penalise them for taking early action. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in that. I can't give any kind of outcomes for that just yet, but um, that's underway. I just want to finish off now talking about what the kind of some of those future research opportunities are in the pipeline. Obviously, this work is um, funded by PGGRC and NZAGRC and carried out by AgriSearch and we are one of the funders of PGGRC, so we have a heavy input into this. So there's four main areas. Obviously the first one, low methane feeds. So there has been certain feeds such as forage rape that shows a, a lower methane output for the same dry matter intake. And there's work ongoing looking into um, what are the markers, genetic markers behind that and how could that be translocated into other dry matter. There's low methane animals, and this particularly in sheep, they've found divergent lines in terms of methane output uh, amongst animals. And that we're really, well, the, the research centres are really looking into what are those, um, what's the markers behind that and the genetic, obviously, markers behind that. And can that be translocated into cattle as well? Many of you all heard, have heard about the methane inhibitors that are coming to market. Um, DSM's 3NOP is, is close, and um, Fonterra has some, some other inhibitors that it's, it's bringing to market in the near future. And they have shown to show a reduction in methane output from the animal due to the, the controlling of methanogens within the rumen. Um, and then the, 
uh, lastly is the fabled methane vaccine. This has been under development for coming up 30 years now, and it's really trying to introduce a, a in a vaccine sort of way, a, a way that a cow would produce natural um, inhibitors in her saliva to manage methane output from her rumen and methanogens within her rumen. So that's a really, some real, that last one's particularly, there's quite some far stretch science and, and there are some, some really hard work trying to get that, um, get that through. Uh, so I think that's about it for me, Sarah. So happy to take questions. Excellent. All right. We've had some questions come in for you, um, Nick. So Richard asked, what are our international commitments specific to food production? So, um, yeah, the, there's always that comment, the, well, the statement within uh, um, the Paris Agreement that says in a, in a manner that does not threaten food production. So, um, so that is always brought up and we have to think about that when we um, set our international commitments going forward and obviously our domestic commitments from that. So that absolutely has to be thought about when we're starting to give our feedback in terms of to the Climate Change Commission and the government later this year. Right. Um, then here's another one. Um, Interesting summary on low carbon footprint among milk producing countries. However, we also need to sell the story that milk is also a low carbon intensive and economical form of protein for developing countries. Are there any studies comparing milk emissions with other protein options such as meat, fish and non-dairy milk products? Yeah. So, so when I talked about that, um, that functional unit of fat and protein correct milk, um, trying to standardise different protein sources is, is very difficult because you've got to find studies that align. However, we are starting to, and we are working with other, some of our other dairy family, other decans and, and other places, we are starting to think about how we compare to alternative proteins. So we're hoping to get uh, that's the next kind of phase in that research and we're hoping to kick that off in the near future. Okay, so now we've got a research question. Um, Michael wants to know, are the inhibitors coming to market or are they still at the research stage? So they're actually at the commercial stage, um, i.e. there are some trials going on with them to test any side effects or anything like that. So they are coming very close to the commercial stage. We expect to see them in the next year or two, um, particularly DSM's 3NOP and, and the equivalent Fonterra one. But um, there's, a, there's a few regulatory hoops that that has to jump through first. So. It's not as an easy a process as just produce something and then we're allowed to use it. Similar to the COVID-19 vaccine, that was expedited, obviously, but it has to go through a whole lot of trials to make sure it's a safe product to use. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your contribution, Nick. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving and we're going to move on to Fraser. Um, so next up, we've got um, Fraser McGogan. So Fraser is a farmer in the Bay of Plenty. They, um, he and his wife run a family farm milking 430 cows, and they've got three kids, which keeps them busy, um, but not so busy that he hasn't put his hand up to be chair of the climate change ambassadors. So he's a farmer representative um, communicating on behalf of, of climate change. And like, um, like every session, we'll have, have a poll here. Um, but Fraser, why don't you first give us a bit of um, background about yourself and, and how you came to be in the role that you are today? Uh, kia ora. Um, I'm Fraser McGugan. I'm a dairy farmer. I'm not just a dairy farmer. I'm a proud dairy farmer. And I'm going to try not to swear, but the bloody dog is chasing the chooks. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'll be right back with you. Uh, firstly, I'd actually just like to thank you very much for taking your time today to come and get on this journey with us. And I love that you're interested in starting somewhere. And that's what we're doing. We're starting. So unfortunately, I can't provide you with all the answers as this is such a rapidly changing challenge which Roger alluded to before, with the government having putting directions and pressures on us, and we each individually have different environments which require different responses. So from Northland to Southland, all of Aotearoa 
we are part of this journey. So we differ enough between neighbours, so I can't tell, think, or even think of telling you how much we're going to differ between regions or across New Zealand, but as long as we can start going the right direction, that would be great. So the one thing which we do have though, is we have a group of climate change ambassadors. Uh, we've been working with Dairy NZ, who have really good people in their organisation, who have been helping us put together a bit of framework around this. But we've got the 12 ambassadors from Northland, so kia ora il, uh, and Andrew, to Southland, where we've got Louise and Steve. And they're all farmers who are like us, and they're intent on making a difference. So why are we here? Because like so many other countries, New Zealand has signed up to the Paris Accord and our politicians have signed us into this across parties. So I think now we get on to what can I actually do about it and what can I do now? Well, with methane being the majority of our emissions in the agricultural sector, we have to really focus on reducing them. So methane is strongly related to the dry matter intake. And so for different farms, we'll have a different set of uh, options. And so I'm actually going to run you through five top tips which I've come across on my farm. Okay, so Fraser, before we, um, before we go to your top tips, do you mind if I just take a poll? Is that okay? Um, and just ask our audience if they know what their farm's um, emissions are. So um, just like all the other polls, we'll just give this 30 seconds to a minute. I've just launched it. Do you know what your farm's emissions are? Yes, no, or it doesn't apply. So this might be if you're a real professional um, or someone who doesn't, doesn't have a farm. We're oh, sitting at 10,711 <laughs> tons of oh. greenhouse gas emissions per hectare, just as an example, putting it out there. So we've okay. got things which we can do. All right, um, we'll give them five, four, three, two, one. We'll end polling, we'll share the results. So 37% of our audience said they do. 27% said no, and then another third about um, it doesn't apply. So um, I think 95% uh, of farmers can now access their emissions through their um, dairy emissions report through their dairy companies. So um, for our audience, you can actually go have a check at that. All right, so off, tell us what um, those five options are, Frazier. Um, so probably my first tip, is know what your number is and this relates directly to the poll we just had if you know what your greenhouse gas emissions are per hectare it's kind of like accounting you can actually start working out how you can influence these results so if you have your accounts to the accounting every year some of you will formulate um, budgets as well and then you also have monthly budgets you can actually start delving down into the details of things which can make you different results. So if you, I'm pretty sure or pretty adamant that you can't control what you can't measure. So if you use your, for instance, your Fonterra Tiaka program um, or other companies that have their different ones, you can actually find out what your greenhouse gas emissions are. So that's my first top tip. And then also you can look delve deeper by investing in Overseer and using that to pull up those numbers and then you can model off that. So once you have got these numbers, you can start focusing on them, you can compare with other people, you can drive efficiencies, and you can also maybe pull out discussion groups with your local um, CEOs and as a group work on solutions together. Thanks, Sarah. My second top tip uh, would be reducing fertilizer use. Uh, focusing on uh, just one, for example, would be nitrogen. So the smart use of nitrogen fertilizer is important because if you don't use it properly, it volatilizes with nitrous oxide being given off by the oxidization process when it's exposed to air. So we use GPS technology on our tractors. Uh, it's a bit of an investment, but it means that we don't get overlap. We don't have to use as much. Anyone can put 
nitrogen on and we have proof of placement. So it's a lot more accurate. And then from there, I order 10% less fertilizer or actually we're at about 25% less fertilizer, fertilizer N in this case, because we don't do gateways. Uh, hotspots, you don't need them. Additionally, when we use N, we use 10% rule, which is using 10% less, make sure there's 10 mils of rain within 10 hours. Like these rules have been around for a while and it's about implementing and making sure it's things which you actually do on farm so that we can make some big um, improvements. So I struggle with advice to the contrary, but use best practice and focus on it. And then you start focusing on growing clover instead of nitrogen. Simple little top tips. <laughs> so thanks, Sarah. My next tip would be understanding your feed. Methane is closely linked to the amount of dry matter intake that your cows have. This point is about ensuring that you are using feed as effectively as possibly, possible and efficiently. Match your stocking rate to pasture growth and not how much supplement you can afford to buy. It's really 101 going back to what your farm can sustainably handle. Farm within your biological limitations. The next interesting thing which I've looked at is if more than 5% of your feed is imported, identify the least profitable feed in the system. Then, if you're still using more than 5% of imported feed, research is quite clear that there's likely to be efficiency and profitability gains by decreasing these levels. Some people have systems which are specifically set up and they match them really well. These people, some you can do it really well, but ideally there are opportunities here for most farmers. Like I'm not always on the ball, I miss steps, and so there's opportunities for me as well. Optimizing the pasture supply on your farm and using the profitable use of nutrients, cropping and regrassing is important. If you make sure that your pastures are producing as much as possible and then using the nutrients which you have put into your system effectively, you'll stop losing them. It's like using your effluent paddocks. Uh, before, people used to think of it as just something to get rid of. Now you think of it as a fertilizer and a really good fertilizer. So if you're focusing on your pasture performance and the key is feed eaten, there will be a big improvement to your farm. And you've got to remember that pasture will be a premium, or pasture produced milk will be a premium product in the future. There's a growing demand across the world for quality of food. So moving on to my next top tip, <laughs> top tip, it's reducing your maintenance requirements. And I've tied in here, reducing replacement rates and wastage. So don't carry more cows than you need to. Try and match your stocking rate to pasture availability and focus on your high BW quality cows. So you don't have passengers who take two years of feeding to just exit your system if they aren't good quality animals. It's uh, inefficiency. And one of the key ones is reducing deaths. Like we all strive for that. And I think we'll never stop striving for that for looking after our cows as dairy farmers. So another few little bits are tighten up your carving pattern. This enables you to efficiently utilize your pasture and then you don't push big surpluses through which you then have to top or you have to cut for excessive silage or losing quality. So focus on utilizing grass for making milk, not maintenance is one of these key tips. So the basic maths here is less empty cows equals a lower replacement rate needed to be carried through. So a reduced replacement rate means less maintenance feed requirements and greenhouse gas emissions. So finally, uh, focusing on profitability. Everyone talks about it, but not everyone does it. So, you know, Karen, who asks you about production? You know, kilos of milk solids, what are your cows doing? What are they doing per hectare? What's your total kilos of milk solids? What litres are they doing? Well, that means nothing now. Look at profitability. Look at your farm working expenses, your break-even milk price, your EFS, your gross margins, and dollars in the bank. Build a resilient farm system based on being profitable, not on production. Remove the New Zealand fixation on production at any price and focus on profitability, efficiency, and most of all, sustainability. You can decrease production and make more money in a lot of instances if you are onto it and you're 
pulling it in. Like some businesses are perfect and they're running really well. I can't correct you, I can't <laughs> do anything, but for some of us, we've got an opportunity there to be more efficient. So look hard at your business and ask for help if you need it to profitably uh, increase profitability and decrease your greenhouse gas emissions. So in conclusion, hopefully you know why we are expected and want to reduce emissions from our farms. And these five key tips might help, but they are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you will probably start innovating. And if you let us all know, we can all pick up these little ideas and keep on progressing our farm systems. We're not alone and we're not doing this by ourselves. There's people who are interested and thank you for joining me. And so I'm off to buy an electric uh, motorbike now, but um, I've got to try and make it fit my system rather than just putting it in. So kia kaha, thank you. Hey, if you can just hold off on buying the electric motorbike just to answer some of the questions that have come in, Fraser. Um, maybe after two, give us 10 minutes more. Um, so one of the questions is, how will reducing imported feed on farm, um, so how will reducing imported feed on efficient farms um, affect emissions per kg of milk solids? So if you reduced imported feed, will that end up impacting on emissions per kg of milk solids? Um, I'll just try and answer this as well as I can. Um, if you are buying in feed and it is expensive, I'm probably looking more at the profitability. So if you aren't making that margin on that feed, potentially you will um, be better off not having it and taking a decrease in production to a slight extent, and that offsets that expensive feed. Okay. Um, then, Fraser, how, how were you confident, like you've actually made some changes on your own farm already, how were you confident to go ahead and, and do that? What, what, what motivated you to go ahead and do that? Um, it was probably from uh, chasing a whole lot of things like production and um, finances in the past through different competitions that it's actually I had that kind of eureka moment where I was, hey, look, there's other things which we can do in the environment and being sustainable and still being here with or leaving the land in a better shape than when we have started. It's just more important. And so if you know your financials behind it, you can comfortably make these decisions. We've got another question here. Um, what do you do if you're already a top performer and you're highly efficient? Are you just being punished by um these rules um i think that the uh, climate change commission have actually said that they won't be um they don't want to affect the early adapters so the people who are making early changes it won't negatively be based on them and i think i've uh, heard that they don't want to go along the grandparenting route which would be fair for you and it's worth making those changes now because yeah, it has a longer term result the longer time you have a change. And the pricing mechanism will probably end up influencing that as well, won't it? Whatever the, um, whatever's set there. Yeah. Um, okay, and there was another question. It's, it's disappeared um, for us. But actually, last but not least, I have a question for you then, Fraser. So, um, if, what would you encourage farmers to go away and do today? What's something that they could do to start um, themselves on this journey? Um, know your numbers, uh, look up your report from your dairy processor, but there's also step change uh, meetings from Dairy NZ, engage with them in your area. It is just such a good opportunity to uh, work with other farmers who will be interested, will be doing the same things in the same geographic location. So I think we might be able to post those up later on. Yeah, that is a key. Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a great segue in the slides. So Step Change is a Dairy NZ project that is looking at not only how do we meet um, emissions, reduction targets, 
but also water quality um, expectations and the new national environmental standards that came through in August, but still having that profitable business that meets your personal goals and um, your financial commitments. So it's how does all of this fit together in a farm and a farm system? So um, there are events running across the country um, and you can find out more information at the dairynz.co.nz slash step change um, to get the detail. But for example, in Stratford, we've got a profitable business that just happens to have a low environmental footprint. So they have focused on achieving their own personal goals and inherently have a low environment footprint farm versus in Culverton, we've got a farm that's actually been actively working to reach that 190 end cap, um, which will have an impact on their nitrous oxide emissions and their end leaching, as well as meeting um, the NES standards um, versus some of those Southland farms where they've done some modeling, looking at what are our different options and how does this impact profit. So if you go along to the events, you'll get a bit of a policy update um that's specific to your region as well as an op opportunity to have a look at what other farmers are doing for options on their farms um, and finally have your say you get to make a submission so there will be an email that comes out next week um, from darian said ce to mackle we'll have that submissions template form um, online and you, you can submit that. If you could want to visit the Dairy NZ website for more information, we have a lot of the newest, most relevant stuff is going to be on the homepage. Attend that step change event, like um, Fraser said, he didn't mention he's actually um, hosting an event himself. So if you'd like to see Fraser live and in person the 7th of April in the Bay of Pliny, and um, last but not least, you're going to get posted a survey. So this is a great opportunity to give us feedback of what more information would you like? Um, how can we improve better for next time? What did you really like and want to see again? Um, so if you could complete our survey, we'd appreciate that. Um, and tomorrow you're going to get an email with um, the web link um, to this, this session and um, further information. So with no further ado, this is, we're coming to the end of our webinar. Thank you so much for taking the time to join. And on behalf of my colleagues, um, thanks to Laura and Sophie actively working on the Q&A today. Um, and um, Fraser for taking the time to join us. You've got a dog now to sort and an electric motorbike to purchase. So um, have a good rest of the day and we'll see you next time. Bye.